Anyway, if you're joining us online or you're in person today, I just want to welcome you to Rockfish Church. My name is Dan DeBruler, and if you're here in the room, you may have noticed this little QR code on the back of the seat in front of you, and that is a really great pathway to get some great information if you want to know more about Rockfish Church or even if you want to download the app or see how to give, all those things. It's all at the link tree that that QR code will head you to. And the app is really handy, by the way, the Rockfish Church app, if you don't already have it, because you're just one click away from notes on each message that we have here. So if you get a moment, just scan that QR code and you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. But I just want to thank you once again for being here with us today. You know, we've been talking about being armed and dangerous, but more importantly, that truth always triumphs. You know, we are inundated with worldviews that may compete with a biblical worldview. I was watching a movie the other night with my wife, and I was acting like I had seen it the first time, but I was doing something that I hadn't done in years, and that was actually watching a DVD, because the movie I wanted to watch for the 413th time wasn't available on streaming, so I actually went and I dug through the stuff and I saw that we did have a DVD. And so we're watching this movie, and and I realized that even in the movies, everywhere we look, there are worldviews that are trying to get their view across. And in this particular movie, they were talking about the big man upstairs, the guy upstairs, the, the one who's watching and about what, it, what happens to us when we die. And in the movie, he said, man, you know, I've, I read about all this stuff and I've heard about how when you die, you see a light and you go toward the light. And this man was dying. He said, man, it's a lie. I don't see a thing. How sad that we follow something that is so untrue that we, we put our hope in something that doesn't exist, that isn't real at all, or put, it, put our hope in something that means nothing in the end. I was listening to a podcast yesterday, a, a, a Bible teacher that I know, and he said, you know, a worldview isn't really something you think about. A worldview is something you think with. And so as we come together at Rockfish Church and at churches all across the country and all around the world, and we learn to think with a biblical worldview. We begin to see the world around us a lot differently. And as we see that world differently, I hope that we're engaging it differently. You know, Paul, Paul the Apostle, the one that we credit with writing so many of the New Testament books, he taught us a lot about Things. He taught us in Romans a lot of what we get for our doctrine, how to be a leader or a pastor in a church from what we read in his letters to Timothy. But he taught us how to engage culture. He taught us what it meant to stand up, to be people of God, even when it's not easy, even when we look around and we realize we're on this narrow road. And he reminds us, just like that song does, that we're not alone even when we're on that narrow road. And over time, a lot of people have had a lot of thoughts about who God is. The Hindu says, you know, God must be loving and benevolent and gentle. He must be a cow. How we arrive at that, I'm not really sure. The Native American, maybe watching an eagle soar and seeing the majesty of all that, says God must be an eagle soaring over it all, seeing everything. And the ancient Egyptian sees the sun and sees the power of the sun and says, God is raw. God is the sun. And you know, each of them kind of got it right to an extent, but they all missed the point of it all at the same time. All throughout history, all throughout culture after culture, we have had thoughts about who God is and we've missed the point. So what did God do? He didn't just leave us down here wondering what in the world we're supposed to do or how we're supposed to interact with him. Instead, he sent his son, Jesus, the partner in creation, came to earth, lived as a human so that we would understand who he is and how we are to interact with him. We wouldn't have to figure it out on our own. If we want to know what God is like, we simply... Study the person of Jesus Christ. We see how we could be living. We see how we are made to live. We see how we are made 
to interact with God Almighty through studying Jesus. But just who is Jesus? As we look at this, as we look at what it means to see truth triumph over lies, who is this Jesus? You know, we navigate this world of diverse beliefs, and it's important for us to understand that not with, just within Christianity, how he's perceived across many religions, many worldviews, and the significance of that knowledge and the empathy with which we see the world around us. So who is he? Who is Jesus? You know, when we understand Jesus from the Christian perspective, we understand that he's foundational to grasping the broader conversation about competing worldviews, about the things that we see around us. And the more you see who Jesus is, the more he becomes real in your life, the more you begin to follow, the more you will recognize where he is not. And so many of the things that we may even adhere to outside the church, inside the church, with many of the things that we see in this world and call good and perhaps even support with our money or with our time or with what we have, we begin to see that some of these things don't really line up with the truth of who God is. They don't line up with what we see as we follow and learn from Jesus about who God is. His teachings and his actions they invite us to explore deeper meanings of love and sacrifice and even eternal life. So let's take a look who this Jesus is. Jesus is the Word made flesh. In John 1, verses 1 through 3, we read, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning, and through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. This says Jesus is a partner in creation. It introduces us in, to Jesus and Jesus as the Word, indicating the divine nature and the eternal existence right alongside God. We see that Jesus is an eternal being as it emphasizes his central role in creation. He's the Son of God. Perhaps one of the most well-known verses in all of Scripture, we see more references to it than we do people adhering to it. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. See, this highlights Jesus as the Son of God. And this was Jesus talking to a leader of the Pharisees, one of the Pharisees of the Pharisees. He was talking to Nicodemus, a man who was charged with and teaching that he was looking for the Messiah. They were waiting for the one to come. They were reading all the signs. They were translating all the prophecies, all the scriptures of old, so that when the Messiah showed up, that the Jewish people would recognize him. Yet he stood toe-to-toe -to -toe with Jesus on a rooftop at night, asking him what it all meant. And Nicodemus simply didn't get it, so he told him, for God so loved the world, or God loved the world in this way, that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him wouldn't perish, but would have eternal life. This is so key to everything. This is how God sent his son to earth to offer salvation to all of us, to all of humanity, all across time. He is the Messiah. He proclaimed himself as the Messiah. If you recall that passage from John chapter 4, verses 25 and 26, where Jesus is talking to this woman at the well, this woman who went to the well at daytime because that's when the other women weren't there, because she was not welcome around the other women because of her reputation. And Jesus, as he speaks to her, she says to him, the, I know that the Messiah, the one they called Christ, he's coming, and when he comes... He'll explain everything. And then Jesus declared, it says in John chapter 24, verse 26, he says, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. 
Jesus was saying, I am the Messiah. I am the one who we have been waiting for. I am the one who comes to give eternal life to rescue my people. It is me. He confirms his identity as the Messiah, the anointed one, the one prophesied about in the Hebrew scriptures. And in doing so, he says, for everyone, for all people, for people who are not at the top of the chain, but people who are even pushed out of society because of what they have done, because of the sin and the shame that they have, that we have. He's the Messiah for each and every one of us. Looking more closely at Jesus, let's ask, what has he done? What has Jesus done that sets him apart? What has Jesus done that makes a way for us? We see his sacrificial death. You know, we're getting ready to celebrate Easter soon. And understanding it through a true biblical worldview, understanding it by understanding him, will open up things in such a way. In Romans 5, 8, we read about his sacrificial death. It says, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. See, you don't have to get it all together. You don't have to make your way to church and on the third Sunday you can get to know Christ. This says that while we were still sinners, while we were still lost in all that we're doing in this world, while we were still denying him, while we're still pushing him away, he died for us. His sacrificial death makes all the difference and it underscores the core of our Christian faith and belief. Jesus' sacrificial death on the cross, the act of love to redeem humanity from sin, talks about faith. Faith being the pathway to our salvation. But the really good part is the resurrection. Once again, we're getting ready to celebrate Easter. The resurrection, the power that Jesus demonstrated over death is what separates him from any other little g God that the world has ever known. Matthew 28, verse 6. He's not here. He has risen. Just as he said, come and see the place where he lay. He's gone. There have been theories over time that say he was spirited away. He was sneaked away in the nighttime, but he had risen. See, the resurrection is central, signifying Jesus' victory over death and his divine power. And it affirms the hope of eternal life for us as believers, for those who follow him. You know, recently I saw a, a video and it was, it was one of those guys that goes out, you know, and, and he creates an argument in the marketplace and somebody takes the bait and began to argue that I can't believe without 100% proof. If I can't see somehow that Jesus was resurrected, I can't possibly believe. I need 100% proof in everything. I don't believe anything without 100% proof. He said, do you ever go to the pharmacy? Do you, do you ever see what the pharmacist puts in that pill if you go to a compounding pharmacy? Do you ever trust that the pills that are in the bottle that are prescribed for your good are actually what they're supposed to be? We do a lot of things without 100% proof. I'll never see the empty place where he lay, but I know the place where he lives today. And I've experienced his goodness. I've experienced the truth of the resurrection and perhaps you have as well. But it doesn't take 100% proof to believe. That's what faith is. Faith is the evidence of things unseen. When we begin to hold on to what is true because of what we have experienced elsewhere or what we have seen elsewhere. And Jesus has given us all this promise of eternal life. In John chapter 11, verses 25 and 26, 
Once again, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me, even though they die, and whoever lives by believing in me will never die. And then he asked the question. He's talking to Mary and Martha here. He says, do you believe this? That's a solid question that we all need to grab a hold of. Do we believe this? Jesus was about to raise his friend Lazarus from the grave, and he's asking before this, as they're saying, if you had been here, they wouldn't have died. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live. Do you believe this? This is the question for us today. See, Jesus offers eternal life to all who believe in him. Not just to Lazarus, not just to Mary or to Martha, but all of us who believe in him as the pathway to salvation. Jesus is the word, a partner in creation. Jesus is the son of God sent, to God, sent by God to redeem us, his creation, this world. And Jesus is the Messiah, prophesied for centuries and revealed in the flesh, in the person of Jesus. But we're not the only ones who have a perspective on who Jesus is. There are many people who, who see God in many different ways. I mean, we live in a world filled with isms. God created us in his image, male and female. He created us. I don't know, that doesn't mean God has two arms, two legs, and walks around with a head on his shoulders. Being created in his image implies that we can think and that we can reason and that we can create and that we can be and that we can do. And so as man has gone along, culture after culture, century after century, he has begun to think and to reason and to create even gods that are not God. Begin to put thinking and logic and reason above their concept of God. You know, we wake up every day to a number of conflicted and distorted views. Everything from how should we eat, the proper way to exercise, whether the earth is round or flat. All of these things come into our minds as we go through the day. Even how long the earth has existed, because we can think, we can reason. Logic says this, but the supernatural of God may say something different. But as we begin to think our way through things, as we begin to, begin to apply logic as we know it to things, it begins to extend to how we believe God, how we understand and believe who Jesus is. So I want to take a look at some perspectives of, that other worldviews have on who Jesus is. We're going to look at some worldviews. We'll look at a couple of religions, but there's a reason for this. You know, we, we've talked about Jesus, who he is. He's a partner in creation. He's the son of God. He's the Messiah. He's the path for all of us to eternal life. And understanding the genuine is really important. I think the more you watch movies, the more that you see the outlines of various programs, humanitarian programs and, and things like this, the more you'll see how far away they are from who we're created to be. See, federal agents, you've, you've heard the story, I'm sure. They, they learn to identify counterfeit currency by dealing extensively with genuine currency. They're taught to touch and to tilt and to look at and to look through currency so that when they come across the counterfeit, it is immediately evident to them. And this is how we have got to look at Jesus as his followers. If you want to know the counterfeits, it comes down to how well you know the genuine. Have you touched Jesus? Has he really touched your life? Have you 
tilted? Have you looked at, looked through? Have you been serious about finding out who the person of Jesus is and how we relate to God through him? Because our discernment of counterfeits when it comes to these isms will stem from our familiarity with the genuine. There's one son of God. There's one Jesus. There's one way to heaven. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. But from scholars to skeptics to believers to historians, people across the ages have concluded many different things about who Jesus is. So today, as we go through this, I don't intend to explain all the beliefs or all of the practices or the intricacies of these different worldviews in religion, but rather I want to discuss the point at which these belief systems, these worldviews, these isms intersect with Jesus. Because just like counterfeit currency, they're made to look genuine. They're made to look good. They're made to pass through those who are nominally familiar. So let's take a quick look at just a few of these. And as we go through these, and and I begin to unroll this, and by the way, in studying this over the last few weeks, I found it fascinating because I actually had my eyes open to many things that, that I thought were pretty okay until I looked really close, until I began to see the contrast at what is true, or with what is true, rather. So some of these things are going to sound familiar to you. They're going to sound like the world around you. They're going to sound like people who you support, or maybe that you know or work with. But you're going to see things that that look very familiar as we look at these things and where they intersect with Jesus. Because they're very evident in American culture very evident in our lawmaking. See, from a Christian perspective, while there may be many shared values in humanism, like the importance of human dignity and ethical living, there are some places where they take a sharp left as we continue to go forward with Christ. See, the reliance on God, divine revelation itself, the supernatural aspects of faith distinguish Christian beliefs from the humanist ones. Because in humanism, while it focuses on human values, it focuses on human ethics and reason as the center of moral and decision-making processes. And some of these things sound pretty good. When we hear the arguments, whether it's on social media or we hear how they portray something in the news or even in our lawmaking, when we hear some of these things, they sound pretty good. It's like, yeah, man. I, I, I want to treat people good, and that means, wait, it means what? It means I've got to accept this, I've got to affirm that? See, this is not what we are called to do. We are called to look differently at God. See, secular foundations are what humanism are, are built on. Reasoning and natural evidence over divine revelation We think, we reason, we can apply logic. Surely that means that this is okay. We're to love everybody, right? We're to accept everyone for who they are. We see this played out in the marketplace day after day. We see it played out in the laws that we make in this world day after day. We see humanism absolutely at the forefront of all that we do crying out for moral and ethical autonomy. Again, we can reason, and if we can reason, we can rule. We want to apply logic to these situations as far as humanism goes. And sometimes we parade that as humanitarian, that we are just doing good. But it's so far from what God calls us to do, because God is whom we derive our ethics and our morals from. What he says is good, and what he says is not, is what matters. Humanists are very skeptical of supernatural claims. They give no credence to God whatsoever. 
And it emphasizes personal responsibility, shaping our own destiny and welfare in the society. You know, we see these things even in our elementary schools. And you've driven by the school that has the marquee outside that has today's value on it. The things that we live up to, the ways that we tell ourselves that we're good, the way that we pretend that we are superior or that we're growing even in a good way. They're so far from God so often, even in our promotion of human welfare through social justice and human rights and secular governance, pushing God out of our lawmaking, pushing God out of our government. But we're called to bring God into our government. When we see God for who he is, when we see Jesus as the son of God, when we see Jesus as the way and the truth and the life, and then we bring that into our government, that's where we begin to make a change. That's where we begin to make a difference. But humanism, on the other hand, encourages self-actualization, values the pursuit of personal growth, over taking second place, self-actualization of saying that we are superior, we are doing well, and it looks to pride itself on all that we do. But Christians, those who see the world through a biblical worldview, we live a life that's guided by faith in God, not by our accomplishments, not by the many programs that we have that, that affirm others in their belief that make a good life for other people, but how we bring God into the centrality of everything that we do, how do we begin to revere him as the one who is the giver of all things. See, Jesus' teachings absolutely contrast with what we see in humanism. His teachings emphasize dependence on God and the existence of the supernatural, the authority of Scripture, rather than of the laws and the cultural shifts that we make along the way. And it emphasizes the need for salvation. For the humanist, we can attain by doing good. But when we read the Word of God, we see absolutely that there was a way made for us. We don't have to make our own way. Even when we were still sinners, Christ died for us. It recognizes sin, the biblical worldview. And it talks about judgment. It talks about the afterlife, what happens beyond this world. And this one is just sad. I don't know what you know about nihilism, but it denies and rejects the spiritual, divine, or the supernatural in every way. Nihilism is believing that there's nothing to believe in, in essence. And again, I don't, I don't pretend to know everything about the practices and the beliefs in some of these isms. But I can look at the surface and I can realize there's something wrong with that. Jesus says in John 18, 36, my kingdom is not of this world. To believe him is to believe there is spiritual authority and a reality beyond the physical. Nihilism is believing in none of that, that there's nothing worth believing in. It challenges the possibility of knowing anything with certainty, and Jesus challenged this repeatedly. He said, I am the truth, and the truth will set you free. There is a truth. There is something worthy of believing in, and it's Jesus. Nihilism places no value at all on human dignity. Not true nihilism. In Luke 12, 7, Jesus said this, Indeed, the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Don't be afraid. You're worth more than many sparrows. Jesus taught us about purpose. He taught us there is meaning. There is something worth believing in. And true nihilists, they regard suffering and death as final, as meaningless. And 
In John 16, 33, what does Jesus say? He offers us hope beyond the immediate with this. He encourages us saying, in this world, you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. So he acknowledges suffering for what it is. He acknowledges hurt and pain for what they are. But he says, take heart in this. I've overcome the world. As he reminds us, you're going to have trouble in this world. There will be pain. There will be suffering. But I have overcome all of that on your behalf, he says. And probably the most prevalent in our society, in the culture around us, is simply syncretism. And it may sound like a big word, but it's, it's just a few letters, a couple of syllables. You may have heard things like this. Oh, they, they water down the gospel. You've heard things about churches or denominations even, about how they practice their religion and all the things they do, for how they celebrate holidays even, or how they observe things like the communion or even dates on the calendar. The truth is, we, we the church, we the church global, we can do good things bad. We could take all that was made for us, we could take all the ways we were made to relate to God, and we can turn them upside down and introduce a few little things along our way. We can bring things into our churches with the best intentions in the name of inclusivity or diversity or even evangelism that are apart from the gospel. As we begin to bring these other things in, we bring these little beliefs and isms and practices in, that's where we find ourselves in what we call syncretism, where we have overall a biblical worldview. We, we get our authority from Scripture, yet we do these other little things and we begin to bring in pagan traditions and bring in other things into our church and not to step on any toes, but to step on a couple of toes we bring in things like Easter eggs and Christmas trees and trunk or treat, observing things in a particular way that do not line up with who we say God is, who we believe God is, who Jesus taught us that we were to be and how we were to relate to God. We begin to bring all these little things in and they've just become part of who we are. That's syncretism when we begin to adopt a number of little things from different worldviews other than the biblical worldview and make them part of our practices and our beliefs and we come up with our own little ism, that syncretism. There's a biblical caution for all of that. The Bible warns us against mixing faith with elements from other religions. And whether that's making you rethink what you're going to do as you celebrate Easter, or how you will decorate at Christmas time, or anything else. It all matters. How we view God, the, the, world, the view with which we look at the world. Again, it's not the things we think about, it's the things we think with. When we begin to see who God is and who Jesus is, we begin to see the world around us a little differently. And we recognize when we bring things in that don't line up with the Word of God, that don't line up with who we're called to be in accordance to Christ and His teachings. In 2 Corinthians 6, verse 14, it says, Do not be yoked together with unbelievers, for what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? See, we know and we read and we believe or we say we believe that when the light comes in, the darkness can only retreat. But when we allow the darkness a little bit of space, when we bring other things into our world, into our practices, into our homes, and we do it with the best of intentions, when we see a missionary head to the field and make a couple of little changes along the way so that what they're teaching about Jesus will fit a little better with the culture they're trying to reach. This is syncretism. This is trying to make the gospel palatable. 
We talk about churches and say sometimes that they are seeker sensitive. And so they drop their guard, perhaps. And maybe we have done it. Maybe we have dropped our guard on a few things we should have stood firmly with. And we begin to allow these things to cloud our worldview so that we drift slowly away from a biblical worldview and we syncretize these things with who we are as the church, and dangerously so. Do not be yoked together with unbelievers for what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or how can fellowship, or what fellowship can light have with darkness? Serious questions we should ask ourselves. Jesus said it like this, I am the way, I am the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So when we feel like we need to do something in the name of inclusivity, or we need to do something in the name of being more palatable to a culture or to a people, we need to think about how that lines up with the Word of God. Because that begins to define how we see God. And so we need to maintain a biblical worldview in our lives and in our churches. Now, atheism, let's just make it simple. It's the opposite of everything that we know. Plain and simple, atheism is the belief that God does not exist. We, we get that. We know that. Christianity, it's founded on the belief in a personal, omnipotent God who created the universe and has a relationship with us, with humanity, right? Atheism differs from Christianity in just about every way. Morals and ethics. They're morals and ethics for the atheists. They're centered around God, for us, they're centered around God's commands versus the societal consensus and the subjective for the atheist talking about life's purpose and meaning. And I know some, some people who would say they are atheists who are good people, just good people doing good things, but they miss it when it comes to life's purpose and meaning. For us, our purpose is derived from God's plan. But for the atheists, for those who deny God and, and say there is no God, it's all self-determined and inherently life is without purpose for those who don't believe in God. There's nothing beyond this life. There's nothing to live up to. We created it in the view of the atheist. So we get to decide what's right and what's wrong. And we can look at, at the news. We can open the paper. We can open our door and see how well that's working out for the world, right? with thoughts of the afterlife. We have the hope of eternal life in Jesus Christ. This is what we're given. But for the atheists, for those who don't believe in God, who don't believe there's anything beyond this existence, death is simply the end of consciousness and individual existence. There's nothing beyond any of this. And then we see the understanding of and the response to suffering and to tragedy in this world, our understanding is that we are to do good. We are to, to be Christ to those who are around us. We have faith. We have hope. Whereas for those who believe there is no God, there's only the strength of human agency. Only what we can do will matter. And this is where we get distorted words like freedom and autonomy, my body, my choice, right? We decide what's right. We decide who lives, who dies. We decide how to treat other people through concepts like social justice or diversity, equity, and inclusion. Yes, we're to respect other humans, but we're not to accept everything that humans choose to do. When that doesn't line up with the Word of God and their ethics, ethics apart from godly morals are nothing more than promoting 
human flourishing. Get what you can while the getting is good. There's nothing beyond this, nothing to live up to. No single truth, no moral absolute, no absolutes at all. Everything is subjective when there is no God, when there is no authority, when there is no central rule. And this one, I, I mentioned this because of its prevalence in nearby Fort Liberty. Maybe you're familiar with it, maybe you're not. I was not until just over a year ago. I was at a gathering of, of partner ministries within the community with the chaplaincy on Fort Liberty as we began to talk about the number of people. And there was this group over here kind of by themselves that didn't really turn around, didn't really engage and they all had beards. And this is when I first heard Odinism and recognized that it was recognized by the chaplaincy within the U.S. military. And I, I became a little bit fascinated. First, I thought, oh, these guys are looking for a way to go ahead and have a beard now that they're back conus. But that's not the case at all. As a matter of fact, the more I looked into it, the more I realized that it is actually something that is promoted within the military unintentionally. Because they look at things, all the different ways that we can be important. And it, it looks at v valor and courage and honoring those who came before. We begin to look at these things. We begin to venerate our, our ancestors. And we begin to look at all of the traits of a human that are noble or noble sounding. So it wasn't about them getting to have a beard at all. It's that, although they get to, it's about this whole thing where we are seeing the noble traits of man and we're actually creating a God and it, it's based on Norse mythology many many gods and, and I began to think because I said I was going to talk about how these intersect with Jesus and here's how it intersects with Jesus oh Jesus he's your God bring him on because they believe in many gods it's a poly, polytheistic belief system that has many gods but when we begin to get away from the one God and into many gods, we have absolutely missed the point. There is one God. There is one Son of God. One Son of God who says, I am the way and the truth and the life. And no man comes to the Father except through me. So anything that diverts from that at all is already lying to us. And you're familiar, of course, with Satanism, the term Satanism anyway. But in reality, there's more than one belief system, and we often lump them together. There's a theistic Satanism, where Satan is actually a deity and the adversary of God. And then there's, they have uh, spiritual practice like rituals and prayers and ceremonies and all the things that you would think and all the things you see in the movies. But then there's this atheistic Satanism where Satan is merely a symbol of certain human traits like individualism and liberty and skepticism towards authority and societal norms. I don't tell you about these things to fear them. I tell you about them because they're all around you. And I want you to experience the true Christ I want you to be so familiar with the truth, through, with the genuine, that you will recognize the counterfeits as you come across them. As you begin to hear about a compassionate or an empathetic group in the world that's asking you to just send $7 this month, think about what they stand for. Look at what they stand for, because we can do good. We, the church, the people of Jesus Christ, we can do good. But it comes down to who do we say that he is? And so the question, do you believe this? Just like Jesus asked Mary and Martha, do you believe this? Do you believe these things? Are you familiar enough with the genuine to distinguish the counterfeit when you come across it? Will you stand? Truly for all of us, 
we should be seeing the world through a biblical worldview. And again, a worldview is not necessarily what you think about, but it's what you think with. It's how you see the world around you. It's how you see the other people in the world that you are living in, the other people you interact with at work, wherever you get your recreation. It's the people around you, they need to hear the truth of who God is. You know that. And if you believe and adhere to the fact that Jesus is the way, the truth and the life, man, you'll wanna share it with people. I felt like I was cramming this together, just trying to give you a, a little view of the world around you today. And there is so much more, so much more than I know, so much more than I want to know. But I hope you'll take a look at things sincerely. I hope you'll look closely at who God is and that you begin to walk that narrow road toward him and with him and let him guide you in your thinking let him guide you in your spending. Let him guide you in your evangelizing by how you live and who you are in the circles you walk in. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for being with us. Thank you that even when life gets tough, life gets hard, and we, we deal with things that we'd rather not know about. Thank you that you're there to lead us and to guide us, to guard our hearts, when things come at us that are not true or they're just hard. And thank you for the place you've given us in the circles in which each of us walk. May we be those who bring the light into those dark places. May we interact with others the way that you chose to interact with us, to come and to show us what it means to be the way. Show us what it means to know the life and to live with the truth. I pray that you be with us as we go. Keep our eyes open in Jesus' name. Amen.